All rise. We will obey. The International Criminal Court is now in session. The Dance of Court Penal International, eight of word. Good afternoon. Please be seated. The hearing of the Appeals Chamber is now in session. I'd like to welcome everyone uh, who is here today in the courtroom, in the gallery, and uh, those who are joining, welcome also those who are joining us uh, via the internet or otherwise. First, I'd like to ask the court officer to please call the case. Thank you, Mr. President. The situation in Libya in the case of the prosecutor against Saif al-Islam Gaddafi and Abdullah al-Senesi, ICC 0111-0111. We are in open session. Thank you very much. I'm Judge Gurula, and uh, I'm the presiding judge uh, on the appeal just uh, called uh, the court officer. And I note uh, the permission was given to the, by the appeals chamber to the photographs, the photographs to be taken, and I note that the photograph has left. Thank you anyway. I would uh, first like to ask uh, the parties and participants present at this hearing to introduce uh, themselves. Should we start uh, with the Council for Libya? Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. President. Good afternoon. I'm Pai Mahavan, appearing on behalf of the government of Libya, together with my colleagues, uh, Michelle Butler, um, Mr. Wayne Jordash, QC, Ms. Emma Collins, and Mr. Paul Clark. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let me now turn to the Office of the Prosecutor. Good afternoon, Your Honor. It's uh, Fabrizio Wariglia, Prosecution's Coordinator, and appearing with me today are Mr. Julian Nichols, Senior Trial Lawyer, Mr. Reinhold Galmetzer, Appeals Counsel, and Mr. Hesha Murad, Trial Lawyer. Thank you very much. Uh, and then uh, the defense team of Mr. Gaddafi. Uh, Would you be so kind? Yes, may it please you, Mr. President, uh, John Jones QC. Uh, I appear on behalf of Saif al-Islam Gaddafi, uh, assisted by Ms. Sarah Baffadel. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, Council of the Office uh, of the Pub uh, Council for the Office of Public Counsel for Victims. Sorry. Good afternoon, Mr. President. Victims in these proceedings are represented by the Office of Public Counsel for Victims. Appearing today, Ms. Sarah Pele, Counsel, Mr. Mohamed Abdu, Associate Legal Officer. And I am Paulina Massida, Principal Counsel. Thank you very much. Uh, in addition to the court officer and court usher, I have in front of me uh, Volker Nerli, legal advisor of the Appeals Division, and legal officers Barbara Roach and Anthony Jackson. Thank you very much, all. We are also joined today by the staff of the registry, including court officer, court usher, as I indicated, court reporters, interpreters, stenographers, security officers. And uh, I welcome them all and particularly thank uh, for their assistance already at this stage. <coughs> I shall now summarize uh, the Appeals Chamber's judgment and the reasons for it. I would emphasize that this summary is not part of the written just judgment, which is the only authoritative account of the Appeals Chamber's ruling, rulings and reasons. Written judgment will be made available to the parties uh, shortly after the conclusion of this hearing. 
The appeals chamber's judgment is by majority, with a separate opinion by Judge Song and a dissenting opinion by Judge Ushatska. I will also briefly summarize uh, these opinions after having concluded the summary of the majority judgment. I will start with a very brief procedural history. On 1st May 2012, Libya submitted uh, its challenge to the admissibility of the case against Mr. Saif al-Islam Gaddafi. Further filings uh, in relation to this, to this challenge were made in the course of the following year by both Libya and other parties. On 31st May 2013, the pretrial chamber issued the impugned decision finding the case against uh, Mr. Gaddafi to be admissible. On uh, 7 uh, June 2013, Libya filed its appeal against the impugned decision requesting that the appeals chamber reverse the impugned decision and determine that the case against Mr. Gaddafi is inadmissible. Again, further filings were made in the course of the following months. Before turning to consider the crowns of the appeal raised by Libya, I will first uh, uh, deal with a, pre a, a preliminary issue that is Libya's request to submit additional evidence on appeal. In essence, Libya requested the admission of minutes of a hearing that took place in Libya on the 19th of September 2013, in addition to the opportunity to file by 2nd December 2013, the relevant extracts of the accusation chamber dossier and additional witness statements and evidential material as well as limited submissions on their contents. The prosecutor, defense and victims opposed this application. The Appeals Chamber recalls previous jurisprudence in which it has found that its function is corrective in nature and that, quote, the scope of proceedings on appeal is determined by the scope of the relevant proceedings uh, before the pretrial chamber, unquote. As the minutes of the hearing of the, of the 19th of September 2013, concern a hearing that post-dates the impugned decision. The appeals chamber reiterates um, that facts which uh, post-date the impugned decision fall beyond the possible scope of the proceedings before the pretrial chamber and therefore beyond the scope of the proceedings on appeal. Concerning the information which Libya wished to submit later as additional evidence, the Appeals Chamber notes that this information has not been considered by the Pretrial Chamber. In the circumstances of this case, it would not be appropriate for the Appeals Chamber to consider this material when the Pretrial Chamber has not done so. Accordingly, the request uh, to submit this information must be rejected. <coughs> the Appeals Chamber confirms that should Libya wish this information to be considered by the court, the correct avenue would rather be for it to submit that information to the pretrial chamber as part of an application under Article 19, 19 para 4 of the statute which provides uh, that, quote, in exceptional circumstances, uh, the court may grant leave for a challenge to be brought more than once or at a time later than the commencement uh, <clears throat> of the trial, unquote. In such uh, circumstances, uh, 
the pre-trial chamber could decide whether to grant leave to Libya to bring a second challenge to the admissibility of the case. Turning to the merits of the case, merits of the appeal rather, I would recall that Libya has raised four crowns of appeal, which I will now deal with in turn. In the first ground of appeal, Libya argue, argued that the pre-trial chamber, having found that there was an ongoing domestic uh, investigation covering discrete aspects of the case before the court against Mr. Gaddafi, should have concluded that the domestic investigation concerned the same case in terms of Article 17.1a of the statute and that the pre-trial chamber erred by requiring proof of the actual contours of the case and its precise scope. The appeals chamber considers that this ground of appeal essentially revolves around the interpretation to be given to a case as referred to in Article 17.1a of the statute and in particular how a case being investigated by the prosecutor and one being investigated by Libya should be compared. Article 17, 1A of the statute provides in relevant part that the court shall determine that a case is inadmissible where the case is being investigated or prosecuted by a state which has jurisdiction over it unless the state is unwilling or unable genuinely to carry out <coughs> the investigation or prosecution. The appeals chamber considers that this ground of appeal raises three interrelated issues. First, <coughs> the meaning of the term case as referred to in Article 17, 1A of the statute, including the role of underlying incidents in defining the scope of a case. The Appeals Chamber confirms that the parameters of a case are defined by the suspect under the investigation and the conduct that gives rise to criminal liability under the statute. The conduct that defines the case in situations such as, such as the present is both that of the suspect and that described in the incidents under investigation, which is imputed to the suspect. Second, how to compare the cases under investigation by the court and domestically to determine whether they are under the same. The Appeals Chamber considers that in assessing admissibility, what is required is a judicial assessment of whether the case that the state is investigating sufficiently mirrors the one that the prosecutor is investigating. And third, whether a state challenging the admissibility of a case before the court is required to establish the actual contours or precise scope of the domestic investigation. The Appeals Chamber considers that to be able to carry out assessment as to whether the case is being investigated, it will be necessary for a chamber to know the contours or parameters of the investigation being carried out, both by the prosecutor and by the state. Turning to the pretrial chamber's findings, the appeals chamber notes that the pretrial chamber concluded, having analyzed the evidence before it, that that evidence did not allow the chamber to discern the actual contours of the national case against Mr. Gaddafi, such that the scope of the domestic investigation could be said to cover the same case as that set out in the warrant of arrest uh, issued by the court. The Appeals Chamber has found that it must be possible 
for the pretrial chamber to discern the contours of the investigation being carried out at the national level in order for it to be able to compare if the same case is being investigated domestically as well as by the prosecutor. As the pretrial chamber required just that, the appeals chamber can find no error in its legal conclusion. Libya has also argued uh, that the pretrial chamber erred in not providing sufficient reasoning. The appeals chamber finds that the impugned decision is sufficiently reasoned and that it indicates with sufficient clarity the basis of the decision. I now turn to the second ground of appeal, which essentially raises allegations of error of fact. In this regard, at issue is not whether the appeals chamber would have reached the same factual conclusion as the pretrial chamber, but rather whether the pretrial chamber's factual conclusion could be reasonably reached based on the evidence before it. The Appeals Chamber first addresses Libya's allocations of error in, relations, in relation to individual items of evidence. <coughs> Based on the above standard, and for the reasons set out in the judgment, the Appeals Chamber concludes that the pretrial chamber's conclusions were not unreasonable. Libya has also argued that the pretrial chamber took an unreasonable approach to the evaluation of the evidence as a whole. The appeals chamber concludes that it is apparent from the impugned decision that the pretrial chamber properly considered the evidence that was before it. It concluded that although certain investigative activity was taking place in Libya, the evidence taken as a whole does not allow the chamber to discern the actual contours of the national case against Mr. Gaddafi, such that the scope of the domestic investigation could be said to, to cover the same case as that set out in the warrant of arrest uh, issued by the court. The appeals chamber considers that this conclusion was not unreasonable. In conclusion, as uh, Libya has uh, failed to establish that the pretrial chamber's factual conclusions were unreasonable, the second ground of appeal is dismissed. Turning to the third ground of appeal, this essentially raises allegations of procedural errors. Libya argues uh, that the pretrial chamber erred procedurally or acted unfairly by failing to take appropriate measures for the proper conduct of the procedure, thereby depriving Libya of the ability to rely upon highly relevant evidence in support of its admissibility challenge. First, Libya <coughs> argues that the pretrial chamber erred in failing to consider evidence that Libya could have made available to it. It largely questions the procedure implemented by the pretrial chamber for the conduct of the admissibility proceedings. The argument being that the pretrial chamber erred by not properly considering submissions in which Libya advised the pretrial chamber of, its, of the existence of additional evidence supporting its challenge uh, to the admissibility of the case against Mr. Gaddafi. In essence, the arguments revolve around the appropriate interpretation to be given to Rule 57, 58, excuse me, 58 of the Rules of Procedure and Evidence, which provides in Trailia that the Chamber shall decide on the procedure to be followed and may take appropriate measures for the proper conduct of the proceedings. 
In considering these arguments, the appeals chamber does not consider whether the pretrial chamber could have conducted the admissibility proceedings differently or whether it could have given Libya an opportunity to submit additional evidence. Rather, the guiding question for the appeals chamber's review in this ground of appeal is whether the procedure the pretrial chamber adopted uh, was so unfair and unreasonable as to constitute an abuse of, a, of discretion. Having <coughs> considered its procedural background, uh, the procedural background to, the proceed to these proceedings, the appeals chamber concludes that the pretrial chamber did not uh, err. While it's open to chambers pursuant to Rule 58 of the Rules of Procedure and Evidence, to be permitted the filing of additional evidence, they are, not, they are not obliged to do so, nor could the state expect to be allowed to present additional evidence. <coughs> Please, excuse me. Rather, it is for, this, for a state to ensure that the admissibility challenge is sufficiently substantiated by evidence at the time of the filing of the challenge. The appeals uh, chamber considers that the pretrial chamber in this case and in its discretion provided Libya with ample <laughs> opportunity to substantiate its challenge to the admissibility of the case against Mr. Gaddafi beyond the filing of the admissibility challenge itself. <coughs> The uh, appeals chamber considers that it was by no means unreasonable for the pretrial chamber to draw the line when it did. <coughs> Therefore, contrary to what Libya submits, the appeals chamber finds that the pretrial chamber determined the admissibility challenge on the basis of the facts as they existed at the time of the proceedings and did take into account the rapidly evolving circumstances in Libya. Libya also argues uh, that the pretrial chamber should have taken into account the materials submitted in support of its challenge to the admissibility of the case against uh, Abdullah al senussi which was filed on 2nd April 2013. The Appeals Chamber considers that the pretrial chamber did not err uh, as Libya, Libya did not specifically request that such material be considered in the context of the Gaddafi, Gaddafi proceedings. And Libya had not been on notice uh, that the scope of the case being considered related only to the case of Mr. Gaddafi. Libya argues further that the pretrial chamber erred in failing to clarify its position related to the burden and standard of proof, recalling also that there was a significant degree of disagreement as to the meaning of the term case. The appeals chamber considers that the existence of disagreement between parties as to the interpretation of the legal text is not an uncommon feature of judicial proceedings and that it is the responsibility of the chamber to adopt uh, the interpretation that it considers to be correct when uh, adjudicating on the proceedings. It is usually only in its decision that the chamber is required to provide what uh, in its view is the correct interpretation of the law which is uh, thereafter which it thereafter applies to the relevant facts the appeals chamber considers therefore that the arguments presented by libya under this slim are misguided and premised on the misunderstanding of the obligations of a chamber in circumstances such as those in the instant proceedings <coughs> <coughs> 
In any event, the Appeals Chamber also recalls that the pretrial chamber, in particular in its decision issued on the 7th of December 2012, provided extensive guidance to Libya as to what it expected uh, <coughs> should be filed to substantiate its challenge. In providing such detailed guidance, the pretrial chamber provided effective and useful guidance as to what Libya was required to produce to substantiate its admissibility challenge. Finally, Libya argues that the pretrial chamber essentially rejected its request to submit additional evidence because it had in any event, decided that there were concerns as to Libya's ability genuinely to carry out the investigation or prosecution. The <coughs> Appeals Chamber rejects this argument. It notes that the impugned decision devotes a considerable number of pages to considering the first limb of the complementarity assessment. Paragraph 135 in particular clarifies that the pretrial chamber considered the evidence as a whole and held that it did not allow it to discern the actual contours of the national case against Mr. Gaddafi. Since Libya has fallen short of substantial, uh, since uh, I quote, uh, Libya has fallen short of substantiating by means of evidence of a sufficient degree of specificity and property value, the submission that a domestic investigation covers the same case that is before the court, unquote. Paragraph uh, 136 and the first part of paragraph 137 clarify by means of recalling the most salient steps of the proceedings, why the pre trial chamber was of the view that it had provided Libya with sufficient opportunities to submit its evidence. The appeals chamber has already found that these conclusions were not unreasonable. Against this background, the appeals chamber considers that although, although the wording of the impugned decision may be unfortunate, it is merely an introduction to the next section of the impugned decision dealing with the willingness or ability genuinely to investigate and prosecute. It does not interpret the pretrial chamber to say that it rejected the submission of any additional evidence because the second limb of the test was not satisfied. Finally, turning to the fourth ground of appeal, Libya argues that the pretrial chamber erred in fact and in law in finding that due to the unavailability of its national judicial system, Libya is unable to obtain the accused or the necessary evidence and testimony or is otherwise unable to carry out its proceedings, proceedings uh, pursuant to Article 17, Para 3 of the statute. The Appeals uh, Chamber has concluded that the pretrial chamber did not err uh, in finding that Libya had not satisfied the pretrial chamber that it is investigating the same case. Noting that uh, the fourth ground of appeal raises the question of Libya's ability, under Article 17.3 of the statute, the Appeals Chamber recalls that it has found that in considering whether the case is inadmissible under Article 17.1a and b of the statute, the initial questions to ask are, first, whether there are ongoing investigations or prosecutions, or second, whether there have been investigations in the past and the state having jurisdiction has decided not to prosecute the person concerned. It is only when the answers to these questions are in the affirmative, one has to look to the second half of the subparagraphs A and B and to examine the question of unwillingness and inability. <coughs>
to do, otherwise would be to put the cart before the horse. According to the Appeals Chamber, does not proceed to consider the, ar the arguments raised under, the, under ground four of the appeal. <clears throat> In conclusion, on the appeal pursuant to Article 82 1D of the statute, the Appeals Chamber may confirm, reverse or amend the decision appealed. In the present case, and for the reasons given, the Appeals Chamber confirms the impugned decision and dismisses the appeal. I now turn to the separate opinion of Judge Song. Judge Song agrees with the majority of the Appeals Chamber that it is appropriate to confirm the impugned decision and to dismiss Libya's appeal. However, he disagrees with the majority's interpretation of the term case in Article 17 1A, the first ground of appeal, and the conclusion of the majority that Libya has failed to establish that the pretrial chamber's factual conclusions were unreasonable. That is the, the second ground of appeal. He therefore proceeds uh, to consider the fourth ground of appeal in relation to which Judge Song does not find any error in the pretrial chamber's conclusion in respect of Article 17.3 of the statute and finds the case to be admissible on that basis. In relation to ground one, Judge Song considers that in comparing the conduct being investigated, by the prosecutor with that being investigated by Libya in the circumstances of the specific case, he considers that for it to be found that domestic investigation being carried out in Libya covers the same case. It must be found that it covers first the use of the state apparatus by Mr. Gaddafi Second, uh, for the alleged commission of the crimes of killing and persecution. Third, committed in the time period of 15th February uh, 2011 to, the, to at least 28th of February 2011, the same year. And fourthly, against civil, civilian demonstrators or alleged dissidents of Muammar Gaddafi's regime. And finally, fifth, uh, across Libya. Chatsong notes um, that the pretrial chamber found that the events expressly mentioned in the arrest warrant decision constitute samples of a course of conduct of the security forces under Mr. Gaddafi's control. From this statement, he considers that it is clear that overlap between the incidents is not a relevant factor for the purposes of determining whether the national investigation covers the same conduct as that alleged uh, by the prosecutor in the present case. In uh, Judge Song's view, it is irrelevant uh, for the purposes of this admissibility challenge whether the national investigation covers different incidents, including incidents not specifically mentioned in the arrest warrant decision. To require that the national investigation must cover the same incidents would, in his view, set too onerous uh, a standard for admissibility challenges in cases like this one, where there are potentially hundreds of incidents to investigate, and where, in addition to person under investigation, is not alleged uh, to have physically committed any acts of murder and persecution. In relation to the second ground of appeal, Judge Song considers that the pretrial chamber's findings finding on the evidence was unreasonable. 
He concludes that when assessing evidence, the evidence as a whole, more than discrete aspects are being investigated by Libya and the pretrial chamber should have concluded that Libya is investigating the same case as that being investigated by the prosecutor. Having concluded that the same case against Mr. Gaddafi is being investigated by Libya, Judge Song found it unnecessary to consider the third ground of appeal. However, in order to determine whether the case is inadmissible, he found it necessary to consider the fourth ground of appeal, which concerns whether there was any error in the determination of the pre-trial chamber that Libya is unable genuinely to carry out these proceedings. In relation to Article 17.3 of the statute, Judge Song addresses Libya's essential arguments that the pre-trial chamber erred in its interpretation and application of the term unavailability of its national judicial system and that it further erred by finding that the Libyan judicial system was unable in relation to the case against Mr. Gaddafi. Judge Song does not find any legal error in the pretrial chamber's approach to unavailability. Contrary to Libya's submissions, he finds that the pretrial chamber did consider the criterion of unavailability separately from that of inability and consider that the latter was a consequence of the former. Citing the pretrial chambers finding that Libya's national judicial system was unavailable as a result of Libya facing substantial difficulties in exercising its judicial powers fully across the entire country territory of the country. As a result, Libya was um, in Australia unable to obtain the accused. Judge Song opines that uh, the fact that the two factors require consideration does not mean that there is no link between them. Judge Song further finds that the correct interpretation of the term unavailability in context um, and in light of the object and purpose of the statute is that of the national system being incapable of use which incorporates the notion of being inaccessible in the circumstances of a particular case. In relation to the pretrial chamber's finding that Libya was unable to obtain the accused, Judge Song considers that the issue to be determined is whether the central authorities have been able to obtain Mr. Gaddafi for the purposes of, the, of trial. In this regard, for the reasons he sets out in the separate opinion, Judge Song does not find the conclusion of the pretrial chamber to be unreasonable, namely that Libya, Libya had not been able to secure the transfer of Mr. Gaddafi from Zintan into the control of the central authorities uh, for detention and trial in Tripoli. And that without such, uh, such a transfer, his trial could not take place. Having not found any clear error or unreasonableness uh, in the conclusions of the pretrial chamber in respect uh, of Libya, being unable to obtain Mr. Gaddafi, and given that it is sufficient for one of the alternative criteria in respect of a state being unable under Article 17.3 of the statute to be satisfied, Judge Song does not consider it necessary to rule upon the other aspects of Libya alleged inability. I now turn to the dissenting opinion of Judge uh, Anita Usatska, and I'm very sorry that the air conditioning is not working. 
Judge uh, Ushatska disagrees with the majority that the impugned decision should be confirmed in relation to the first ground of appeal. Judge Ushatska considers that the pre-trial chamber's finding that the scope of the domestic investigation did not cover the same case as that set out in the warrant of arrest issued by the court is erroneous due to its uh, incorrect uh, interpretation of Article 17.1a of the statute. As this interpretation is based solely on the same person stroke substantially the same conduct uh, test, the problem lies, in her opinion, in the test itself. Judge uh, Ushatska considers that Article 17.1a applied in accordance with the principle of complementarity does not require domestic authorities to focus on largely or precisely the same acts of, or omissions that form the basis uh, for the alleged crimes. Requiring that domestic investigations would need to focus largely or precisely on the same acts or omissions uh, would strongly intrude upon the sovereignty of states. Judge Ushatska considers that such a rigid approach would also not take into account the many legal and practical differences between criminal justice systems and even worse would potentially preclude a state from focusing its investigations on a wider scope of activities and instead only on the narrower case selected by the prosecutor of the court. Judge Ushatska considers that the court should, in comparing a case before the court and a domestic case, be guided by a complementarity scheme that contains multiple criteria. As um, one of the criteria that needs to be considered in this case, conduct um, should be understood more, much more broadly than by the pretrial chamber or the majority of the appeals chamber. She states that in the case at hand, the goal of fighting impunity is also achieved, even if not exactly the same conduct as that before the court is under Libyan investigation. But if the suspects link to the use of the security forces in Libya and their consequences are being made the subject of the investigation of the Libyan authorities. A second important criterion that can be derived from the complementarity scheme <coughs> is the clearly expressed and genuine uh, will of the state that manifests itself in advancing investigating steps as exemplified by the concrete actions taken by Libya. Judge Susatska also considers that the pretrial chamber erred in imposing the burden of proof solely on Libya and in its evidentiary standards when assessing the material relevant to the Libyans, Libya's investigations. Judge Ushatska states um, that her suggested approach would most likely lead to a finding that Libya is investigating the same case against Mr. Gaddafi. However, upon consideration of the impunity system as a whole, especially the lack of reasoning and the uncertainty of the pretrial chamber in its findings on the first limb of Article 17.1a of the statute, shown by the fact uh, that they addressed the second limb of Article 17.1a of the, sorry, of the statute, she would have reversed uh, uh, the impugned decision and remanded the matter to the pretrial chamber for fresh consideration. This uh, concludes the summaries uh, of both the majority judgment and the separate and dissenting opinions.
My only task is to thank the parties and participants uh, and reiterate my, my thanks that I express to the staff uh, of the registry for all their assistance. The session is now closed. All rise.